welcome to Just Minding My Business Radio, where we are moving at the speed of God, learning what we didn't know we didn't know. I'm your host, Ida Crawford, so grab a pen and paper and get ready for information that you can use. Welcome, welcome all to another episode of Just Minding My Business, and today I have an inspirational warrior, survivor, and multicultural marketer that I am bringing to the mic. Her name is Dorenda Walker. She is the Vice President within Prudential Financial Incorporated, and she is also a fellow co-author in our book, Women Inspiring Nations. Rising above her childhood difficulties, Dorenda Walker has based her career on expanding new business opportunities and financial education among diverse markets. She focuses her efforts on important areas such as targeted marketing, strategic planning, sponsorship event planning, program management, and community engagement. And, oh, my God, Dorinda has a compelling story, and I am so grateful that she is sharing this with us today. Well, welcome, welcome to the show, Dorinda. Thank you. It's such a pleasure to be on the show, so thank you for having me. Absolutely. So I want to hear all about how Dorinda arrived to where she is today. Sure. So I was definitely on a path to prison or death as an at-risk youth. Um, I, you know, sold drugs. I was severely depressed. I had no morals, no integrity. Um, Both my parents were addicted to drugs, um, and I suffered the consequences of their addiction. They were loving parents, but um, because of their addiction, they made bad choices. And I got caught up in street life and became really depressed. Uh, My dad died when I was 17 from the AIDS virus. My mother had disappeared, and I was just really in a dark place, so much so that I attempted suicide and spent six weeks in a psych ward. And God sent all of these different opportunities and people in my life to kind of change the trajectory and to help me see that my life had a purpose. And it took years of going through the process of forgiveness, finding my faith, and putting in a work to change my circumstances. But I was able to uh, funnel my street smarts and all my life experiences into climbing the corporate ladder. And I'm really proud to say that, you know, I created my own niche uh, job in corporate America doing what I love and loving what I do because I was able to figure out how to leave all the shame and baggage behind from my past and channel that energy on really the woman I was meant to be today and walking in my purpose. So, you know, that's some of what I share in my chapter of the book, um, which is titled Leave the Shame Behind. Mm -hmm. And that's, that's a huge thing when you talk about shame and that's really the the first step of any type of traumatic uh, experience is dealing with the shame piece of it because at some point I know that you probably felt like it was your fault. Exactly. And, you know, it was that fear, I think, of being judged um, for things that happened in the past which really had no authority on the woman that I was destined to be. So once I I came to that realization and realized that I was worthy of the blessings in my life and that, you know, I should understand that I had already been God qualified. So to be worried about what other people who are flawed just like me think about me, was there, you know, that was a misguided sense of fear. Mm-hmm. And and that's uh, that's a typical mindset 
of many, many people of, you know, being wanting to be accepted. And I think that comes back from, you know, being a kid, you know, you kind of learn that behavior early on and to get rid of that type of behavior is very, very difficult because deep down inside we all want to be accepted for who we are. And we all have made mistakes. We've all not gotten it right at some point in our life and will continue to do so. And that piece of judging uh, somebody because they made a mistake or they had no, like in your case, you had no choice. Right. You know, and you were in that situation by no fault of your own. Right, and learning how to share that life experience as and, and wear it as a badge of honor because a lot of people that I grew up with in the hood weren't able to make it out. You know, a lot of people, you know, are dead or in jail are struggling to survive because they were unable to figure out how to get out of that situation and change their circumstance. So I wear my experience now as a badge of honor to say, not only did I survive, because survivors live in spite of, I overcame and became successful in spite of. And I think that's a big difference. And I hope that women are inspired by that um, because, you know, all of those things that happened in our past and that we were able to overcome, we should hold them as a badge to how great and resilient and resourceful we are and our ability to cope and move on. Absolutely. I agree wholeheartedly. So tell me a little bit about what your job is now and what that entails. Sure. So I go, I, I'm go. i a big advocate for, um, you know, creating awareness about issues that are directly related to poverty and gender uh, inequity. Um, so I, I've been advocating um, to bring awareness about drug addiction and solutions, um, because I do believe we need to find solutions um, uh, other than jail, <laughs> especially for black and brown communities. And with this new op- opioid crisis, I see there's a lot of attention because it's now hit white communities really hard. And, you know, I'm a firm believer that if we're going to offer solutions to people based on race, um, there's an inequity there. And there needs to be reparations for the people who suffered from the same disease and were only offered prison as an alternative. So I'm, I'm really advocating against that. I advocate, um, and I'm actually a, a spokesperson in St. Louis um, with the African uh, Diaspora Network, Arden, African Renaissance Diaspora Network, and um, Webster University in support of the UN Sustainability Initiative to bring awareness about HIV and AIDS because there's a huge uh, gender disparity with the number of people who are being diagnosed, which the rates are um, triple the diagnosis rate for women since the 1980s and having lived through that experience in the 80s with the AIDS epidemic, I, I think we should continue to create awareness that it didn't go away. People are now living with HIV and AIDS, but and it's still a problem. And when you look at the uh, epidemic globally with women ages 15 to 44, they're diagnosed at a rate 44% higher than their male counterparts. So, and I, I believe that is directly correlated to poverty issues because there's lack of resources to help women. And then I'm a spokesperson for Real Beauty, Real Women, which is a a nonprofit organization that does cause marketing where they tie um, fashion and beauty into social issues. And right now we're heavily um, advocating to bring awareness about human and sex trafficking because it's affecting uh, women and children at astronomical rates and particularly uh, black and brown women and children. and with really high incidence rates in the foster care system. So that's a little bit what I about what I do outside of my job in corporate America. And in my job in corporate America, I'm essentially responsible for helping the company um, engage women and multicultural consumers 
with educate, education, access, and resources to our financial solution. And the reason why I love what I do in corporate America is because my great-grandfather was an immigrant from St. Kitts who came to North New Jersey in 1906 at the age of 16. He became a self-made millionaire. Uh, Sarah Vaughan went to his music school. He had two supper clubs that were frequented by all the jazz greats. He owned property all over the country. He died in the late 30s, early 40s. And by the time my mother was born in 1953, there was little to no evidence of his legacy. So I feel like I owe it to my great-grandfather to try to change that narrative, not only for our family and make sure that um, all communities are educated with how to build that intergenerational wealth. So that's about me and what I do. And and I forgot the the best part (laughs) and the most rewarding part. I am a wife and a mother and a grandmother, um, so that fills up a lot of my time as well. Oh, awesome! I'm a wife, a, a wife, a mother, a grandmother, and a great grandmother. Oh wow! So I'm, I'm like, I'm getting a generation going on here. <laughs> That's awesome. And I love what you're ta- what you're talking about in terms of financial. Mm-hmm. Uh, in legacies because, you know, I've seen a lot of people that I know that, you know, you, your parents or whoever, your ancestors, work hard and build this legacy, and then it gets passed down to the kids, and they have no clue as to what to do with it and end up losing it all. Exactly, and it's not it's not that we don't know how to generate income and accumulate wealth. It's that we're not educating our our families on how to maintain that legacy of wealth, and we don't have plans set up to make sure that that money and that legacy lives on generation to generation. And I think that we need to have more education and bring more awareness about it. I mean, when you look at black women, we're killing it in terms of income. We have the h- highest, you know, education rates in the country, and Latino women are, are coming close behind us. We're opening up small businesses at astronomical rates, and what we generate to the economy, I mean, is outstanding. If we took a little bit of that in, with, between black and Latino women, it has to be over a trillion dollars of buying power and spend 10% of that on investing in saving and being strategic about um, where we invest and where we save and ensuring that we have trust and wills and estate plans, ensuring that, you know, we dictate how that money can be spent generation to generation, I think, you know, we'd be much better off. Um, you know, we come up with strategies for a lot of things, you know, when there's a civil rights incident, you know, we know how to go and march. We know how to get laws changed, but we need to come together and really be strategic on how we change the narrative on the wealth gap for our community. It's vitally important. Yes, I definitely agree because I'm from the uh, Maryland area and from out of Baltimore, and it's over the last 10, I'll say 10 to 15 years, it's like the neighborhoods are just like uh, ghost towns. You've got blocks and blocks of houses empty, you know, all of these properties that are, you know, trees growing out of a house. And it's like, what happened? What's going on with the community in terms of, helping the community to be able to bring their own communities back to life. So, so and, and this is where I think women have the power. Women are going to control 70% of the intergenerational wealth over the next 40 years in this country. We have the the power. We just need to come together to change it. So imagine if, you know how we get together and we host these uh, empowerment events and there's, you know, 10 women who get together and say, okay, we're going to lend our talent and speaking to this. What if we got 10 to 20 women together to create a capital fund to start investing in those properties and rebuilding those properties and 
and, you know, giving uh, low-income families opportunities for home ownership. I mean, that's a way we can start to rebuild our own communities. We don't have to wait for a politician to come or some big corporation to do it. We have the power. We just need to come together, strategize, plan, and take action. I definitely agree with that, and I'm so glad you said that because there are some uh, communities and organizations within the Baltimore area that are doing just that. And I would definitely um, love to be a part of, you know, women really being that power force in bringing, helping to bring communities back because, and educating the people in the community, give, making sure that the com- people in the community are educated and they are definitely in action with the building of the community. Mm-hmm. Because I think what's happening now is, you know, they the big corporations come in and they build a certain area and then they move all of the low-income people to another area. And yeah, we that's see it. what I Gen- see happening. Yeah, gentrification. And once you see that that certain areas of an urban community are starting to be revitalized, you know what's going to happen. You know that poor people aren't going to be able to afford property in those areas. And I also would encourage people to look into the companies who support, um, you know, support people who are low income with, you know, educational resources, with financial support, with, um, you know, community leadership. So I'm proud to say that I work for a company who does all of that. Um, we've invested quite a bit in, in our own hometown of North New Jersey, mm-hmm. and we're all about making sure that there's financial prosperity t- for all working-class families. So, you know, look and see who's investing in your communities and who's making those impact investments because those are the comp- corporations that we need to be supporting, and the corporations who are taking and not giving, we shouldn't be giving them our business. Absolutely. I agree with you 100%. You know, and people need to be constantly in collaboration and action about this issue because it is definitely happening and it's so unfortunate to see it. I mean, because I grew up in Baltimore City and, I mean, it just really saddens me to see so many vacant houses. You know, I remember as a little girl, you know, we lived in the city, and everybody took pride in the marble steps. And every Saturday, we all had to go out and scrub the steps with Ajax, and the whole neighborhood would have pearly white steps. <laughs> and it was <laughs> such a beautiful thing, and now it's like there's no pride. There's no uh, – it's just really – it's just a mess right now. And um, I'm I'm happy to say that I'm – really getting involved with that movement in terms of trying to educate uh, our young people in, you know, what money really means. It's a tool, you know, and how to um, work with money. You know, I mean, and my son, at eight years old, he had his own checking account, savings account, and he was taught how to fill out a slip. He's been taught how to save, you know, when you get your money, you put X amount of money away, you know, because this is always going to be a rainy day. You can expect that. (laughs) Exactly. And and you need to always put something away. So, yes, the financial disparity is really, really something that we have to definitely stay passionate and in action on, for sure. And and that's... That's another area, you know, educating our children I think is vitally important because they don't get the financial education they really need to make it in life in school. No. So, you know, one of the things that I do with my children, well, I did when they were uh, teenagers, is I had them sit at the table with me and my husband and look at what was coming in and what was coming out and how money was being spent so that they have realistic expectations um, about money and not that m- mommy and daddy can just go to the ATM and they just give us unlimited <laughs> mm-hmm. 
funds. Mm-hmm. And, I, and we thought about that because my youngest son, he said to me one day, he was about six years old, you know, I told him that I couldn't afford to give him something that he wanted. And he said, just go to that machine and get the money. <laughs> <laughs> and then it dawned on me that he thought he just thought that you know that money was never ending. So yeah, it's, it's vitally important that we teach our children. Oh yeah, and the other piece to that is they have to take care of us when we get exactly, there. exactly. And it is our responsibility to make sure that they can. <laughs> And that's the other side that I think about. You know, when I become an old lady and I can't do anything for myself, I'm going to be looking at these young folks who will be in adulthood to take care of me and make the right decisions for me as a senior. So that's, I mean, when you start really thinking about the little pieces that can be affected if these kids are not knowledgeable it definitely um, is a scary thought, for sure. Yeah, and, and I always say to to women or anyone about saving for retirement and in in future um, in their future is it's not if it's going to happen, but when it's going to happen. Mm-hmm. You're going to need some type of medical care, or something's going to happen that's going to require you to go into retirement. Require you to have medical expenses, so you know having a plan for your children to take care of you is not the most ideal thing. It is make sure that you have a plan where you have guaranteed income in retirement through right. you know your you know your employer's four hundred one k or four hundred three b. If you you know an entrepreneur, make sure you set up your IRA accounts. Make sure you're working with a financial professional. That's the number one thing I tell people because people think they could do it on their own, and they have people who have had training who can tell you and help you prepare for what you need to do to to meet your goals. And there's this misperception that it costs a whole bunch of money, and it really doesn't. They they can work with you. Um, where you are, based on where you are and what your goals are. Um, and you need to interview and figure out who's the right person, who has the most vested interest in you and your goals, and is not looking to just make a sale. You know what I mean? Um, okay. But I think it's vital. It's vitally important to have that guaranteed income in retirement. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I just moved some funds over into a guaranteed income um, platform, and I am, you know, getting, because I'm pretty close to my retirement. So, you know, the the typical uh, work uh, 401k is better than nothing. But a lot of times what I find in the workplace, when you begin to ask questions about different funds and different things like that, you don't really get a straight answer. They hand you a perspective, and for a lot of people, that's like, what is this? That's like giving you something in a foreign language. Right. And and that's pretty much all they give you. They don't really sit down and work with you on really making the best uh, decisions as to where to put your money. So I just recently moved some stuff around in, in my portfolio to uh, – Guaranteed uh, income for my retirement, so I'm and, and, and that's why I think it's vitally important to work with a financial professional who understands how to read all those investments to know whether you're too conservative, if you can afford to take more risk in certain areas, if you're too heavy into one area, um, whether it's technology or you know retail or whatever it is. Someone who can look at that overall portfolio and say, okay. You need to invest more here, or you maybe you need to open up another account and invest here, or change this. I think that's the value of working with a financial professional who can help you kind of work through all of that unknown. Definitely, definitely. I wouldn't have it any other way because I'm not that knowledgeable, so I need somebody that has my back and that understands all of that good stuff. Yep. Absolutely. Well, I am so, it has been a great, great, great conversation. How can people get in touch with you? So I am Dorinda Walker on 
uh, Instagram and uh, LinkedIn and Twitter. I am Dorinda J. Walker on Facebook, and my website is DorindaWalker.com. Okay. Well, it has been definitely an empowering conversation, and to learn all of the the things that you're currently doing and what you've overcome is just definitely inspiring to me. And as I'm out and about in my day and meeting people and listening to conversations where there's no hope, I will definitely think of you for sure. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you for being one of the women who's inspiring nations. I think the book is fantastic, and I'm looking forward to getting all the great feedback. I know I was inspired by the stories, and I hope that the readers are inspired as well. I hope so, too, because it was definitely um, a lot of powerful stories in this book. And it's definitely, if you read this book and you don't get moved, then uh, shame, shame, shame on you. (laughs) Because it is some serious, (laughs) powerful stories in this this book. And uh, I'm looking forward to reading every inch of it from front to back. For sure. Awesome. Yes, well, thank you so, so much, Dorenda, for sharing your time with me and my audience. I truly, truly appreciate you. And I'm looking forward to definitely um, following you and doing some things with you and some of the other activities that you do in inspiring women. So I definitely feel like God has brought us together. We thank Cheryl Wood for bringing us together through this amazing book. And I can't wait to see what's in store for us next. All right. Thank you so much, and God bless you. God bless you as well. This show is brought to you by the Amazing Women of a Sister Circle Empowerment Network, a SIN LLC, where we are never in competition, but always in collaboration. And our valuable sponsors, Prodigy Accounting Service. Next Generation Accounting to get you where you need to be. Contact them at prodigyact1 at yahoo.com or online at www.fli-inc.com. Prodigy Accounting Service. Next Generation Accounting to get you where you need to be. Contact them at prodigyact1 at yahoo.com or online at www.fli-inc.com. Ready to plan for your retirement? Contact Game Plan for Retirement. Call 410-902-0464 and schedule a free consultation. That's Game Plan for Retirement, 410-902-0464. Interested in becoming a sponsor for Just Minding My Business 24-7 Radio? Or would you like to know what a Sister Circle Empowerment Network, a SIN LLC, is all about? Contact us today at assistercircle at gmail.com and visit our website at assistercircle.org. That's A-S-I-S-T-A-S, circle.org. Contact us today at assistercircle at gmail.com and visit our website at assistercircle.org. That's A-S-I-S-T-A-S, circle.org. Voiceovers for a Sister Circle Empowerment Network provided by Ruth Haskins Voiceover Actor. To fulfill your professional voiceover needs or to receive her current professional demo, contact Ruth at 443-620-4115. for tuning in to Just Minding My Business Radio. I'm your host, Ida Crawford. We hope you enjoyed the show and appreciate you stopping by. Many blessings to you and yours.